Good morning, and welcome to our devotional time for Sunday, June 28th, 2020. You may notice already our format is a little bit different. I'm a little bit more relaxed here. And the devotional is not going to be a full worship service. And let me explain why. As you know, we did return to in-person church services last Sunday, June 21st. Um, small group, but that's okay. You know, it takes some folks time to warm up, and I understand that. And some folks have concerns, and that's fine too. You know, come when at, and whenever you're ready, um, or when these circumstances seem suitable and, and safe for you. That is fine. But one of the things we had hoped to do starting last Sunday was to be able to actually record the service in the sanctuary and then to be able to post that later on in the day or uh, by early Monday at the very latest. Unfortunately, we ran into a few issues. Um, it's one thing to record something in a setting like this, where everything is quiet, relatively small space. It's another thing to record in a large sanctuary with a lot of ambient noise going on, like air conditioners and fans. And if you did see the uh, videos from last Sunday, you know what I'm talking about. The audio just isn't where we want it to be. The good news is we're working on that. We've already tried a bunch of different things that didn't work, but we have several more ideas to try. So please be patient with us. But until we have something that is of an acceptable quality, we're going to do this instead. Now we'll continue to meet in church for those that um, would like to be there with us. And we look forward to that now each Sunday. But we're also going to provide a, a shorter devotional time for folks who are not able to join us on Sunday mornings. A um, couple of other announcements. The pig roast that the Northern Cluster usually sponsors, on, um, which would have been held on this day at 5 o'clock over at Mayo Park in Millersburg, that has been canceled. I know that that information was sent out in some of the updates. I'm not sure if it made the newsletters or not, but anyhow, it is canceled. Very sorry for that, but with the numerous concerns about social distancing and masks and especially food handling, we thought it best to cancel that. So hopefully 2021. The other thing, just to remind folks, uh, this has been in the newsletter, but to make sure folks know, the Vacation Bible School that Salem and Trinity United Methodist Church were going to sponsor together, that has also been canceled. And by the way, as I've been driving around, I see very few banners for Vacation Bible School. So I suspect most churches have made that same decision because Boy, if you think it's hard to do social distancing as adults, how do you think you can do it with young people? But the good news there is we have a team between our two churches, I should say between Salem and Trinity, working together to provide a brief online presentation and lesson and also a take-home activity. So stay tuned on that. There will be more about that a little later in, in the month of July. So let us begin our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. And let us join in a special prayer for this day. Loving and sustaining God, you call us to obedience, to follow you in all things to give up the things we cling to, and to give ourselves wholeheartedly to your purposes. Give us courage to faithfully follow your leading, even when we cannot see the outcome, even when the path you call us to seems impossible to comprehend. Help us to trust you in all things, to let go of everything that would stand in the way of wholehearted obedience to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And our silent meditation for 
the service is, did you ever feel that God was telling you to do something that seemed crazy at the time? And we'll be discussing that more. We come to our children's time, so I'd invite you to gather the young folks around the device, if they're not already. Um, and in the bulletin that was sent as an attachment to the email that also gave this link, I hope you have followed that. Anyhow, in that bulletin, you'll see a picture of two people on trapeze, trapeze artists. You have the man reaching out to catch, and the woman who has just let go of her trapeze bar flying towards him. And the question is, will he catch her? Well, we certainly hope so. And the key to this is trust. I have been to the circus a few times, probably many of you have too. If you've had the chance to watch trapeze artists way up there, it's scary. Now, I'm not fond of heights to begin with, but you consider the fact that you have people leaping from one to another and trusting not only that their partner can catch them, but trusting their partner is going to be in exactly the right spot at the right moment to catch them. And, of course, they do. They practice and practice and practice. They have a net below them just in case, most of the time anyhow. But, boy, does it make your heart stop when you watch them and wonder, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, is this going to work out okay? Well, it does. Think about that as the way that God sometimes works with us. Sometimes God asks us to do something that seems crazy, something that doesn't make sense. And yet we can sense that it is God that wants us to do it. Maybe it's something like going over and talking to that person at school that has been a bully to you. Someone that doesn't like you, maybe someone you don't like, but going over and talking to them and trying to be friends with them. Now that's crazy, but maybe you feel God urging you to do that. We have to trust at those moments that God will help us through it, that it's something God is calling us to do, or at least that God will make something good come out of it. It may seem crazy at the time, but it comes down to trusting God, even when we think that maybe it doesn't make sense. So let's pray. Lord, even in our young lives, there are many things that seem scary and risky and crazy. So please, if there's something important you want us to do, let us know for sure then give us the courage to do it and help us to make it come out good for your sake. Amen. Our scripture readings come first from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 
Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went up and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Our second reading comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh, and a refreshment for your body. And finally, our Gospel reading comes from Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. And he says, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Here end our readings for this morning. Our message for today is God. Still crazy after all these years. Please join me now for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So picture this. Two people are having an argument about whether someone should do something just because somebody asked them to do it. The one person is trying to explain to the other how dangerous and risky this could be. Someone might ask you to do something illegal or harmful, so you really have to think about it and decide before you either do it or don't do it. And then to make the point, he says to the other person, well, if someone asked you to jump off a bridge, would you just go ahead and do it? The other person responds, well, not again. It's an old Smothers Brothers joke. Now, we've probably all done some crazy things in our lives, and so far we've lived to tell the tale. But what was the craziest thing that someone else ever asked you to do? Maybe you've been part of one of those team building exercises in scouting or in sports or even at work. You know, and they make you do these goofy things. But you know that the point is that you do them together and it helps to build trust and teamwork. Crazy stuff like three-legged races, escape rooms, indoor mini golf, or that classic where you allow yourself to fall backwards, trusting that everybody else is going to catch you. Now, these are crazy, but they're done for a reason, and they serve a purpose. So, we humor our scout leaders and our coaches and our bosses, and we go along with these activities because, well, first off, they're not all that risky. And secondly, we know that they are intended to bring about better communication better teamwork, 
more trust. But what if someone asked you to do something truly risky? And on top of that, they did not give you a good reason for it. Unless you work for the Mission Impossible team, Mr. Phelps, you would certainly have some hesitations, and for good reason. But this is exactly what Abraham runs into in our first reading. It's the classic story of the almost sacrifice of his son Isaac. Now remember, Abraham and Sarah are both a gajillion years old. They never thought they'd have a child, even though God had promised that they would. And then they do have a child together, Isaac. God has fulfilled the promise. And now there will be descendants. They will multiply. They will inhabit the promised land. And everything will work out just as God had promised so long ago. Except, except now, out of the blue, God tells Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a human sacrifice, a burnt offering. And just to twist the proverbial knife a little deeper, God makes it very clear. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. There's no mistaking what God wants, and there's no mistaking how much it's going to hurt Abraham, not to mention Isaac. I can just picture Abraham here. Say what? Hey, God, I don't have any spare kids here. Everything you promised me, a son, descendants as numerous as the stars, a land, all of this hinges on Isaac, on Isaac growing up so that he can go forth and multiply. And now you want me to kill him? Ruin the whole promise? What, are you crazy? How can you give me a son? How can you lead me on and then just take it all back? God, not only is this crazy, it's not fair. All right, maybe I'm projecting how I would react because Scripture actually doesn't give us any of Abraham's internal narrative, his thoughts, his feelings. So even if he did object and question, which I gotta believe he did, we don't have a record of it. Nope. We are told he just gets up, packs up the kid, along with a knife and some wood and servants and a donkey, and the fire. Remember that they actually had to carry fire with them back then. And off they go. Now, before we jump to the happy ending, the angel stops Abraham, Isaac is saved, a conveniently snagged ram is sacrificed instead. Before we get there, let's imagine what's going through Abraham's mind as he binds his son and puts him on the altar. For that matter, Let's imagine what Isaac was thinking and saying or screaming while all this is going on. You see, at some point, Isaac had to figure out he's the sacrifice. And I'm sure he didn't stay quiet about that. In fact, maybe that's why Abraham left his servants behind, so they wouldn't try to stop him from killing his own son. Now again, father and son here have to be questioning this crazy request from God. I think about it. Kill Isaac and all the other promises disappear. No offspring. No countless descendants. No one to live in the promised land. Or just imagine Abraham going back to Sarah with no kid in tow. Oh, that would not be good. It is all insanity and chaos until until the angel speaks, stopping Abraham from killing Isaac. And when the angel speaks, suddenly it all makes sense. Now I know that you fear God, the angel says, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Wow. A crazy request, but now it makes sense. Got a little bit close to the edge there, but everything works out okay in the end. Well, except for the ram. 
Friends, this is how God works in our lives even today. Sometimes, sometimes we get the craziest nudge from God. Something that not only makes no sense, but is actually counterintuitive. Like, now wait a minute, God. If I do that, then isn't that going to cancel out something else? And isn't that going to cause problems down the line? And God either says, yep, or more often, God says nothing. But that urge, that nudge, it remains so strong that we know we have to do it, even though it does not make sense. Suddenly, it's as if God is quoting that old Nike's sneakers slogan, just do it. So some small examples of just do it. You get that nudge to call an old friend or relative, and you find out that your timing was perfect. They're going through a rough patch. Or meeting someone for the first time, and when it's time to go, out of the blue, you give them a kiss on the cheek, and it turns out later that you marry them. Or some bigger examples. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She felt called to work with the poor and lepers in India, even though it put her own health and safety at risk. Now, lots of people, including lots of church leaders, tried to discourage her, even forbid her. But in the end, they gave in. And by responding to that crazy call from God, Mother Teresa started a global movement of compassion toward the desperately poor and ill. Or what about, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yeah, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. He did something crazy for God. Now, you may already know that he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. <laughs> what you may not know is how he ended up in television with a children's show that ran for 32 years. Story goes that Fred Rogers, young Fred Rogers, came home from college during his senior year, 1951, and he found his parents had bought a television. <laughs> oh, sure, wait till the kid goes away to college and then buy the TV. Well, this is Fred's reaction to it. He says, I went into television because I hated it so. And I thought, there's got to be some way of using this fabulous instrument to nurture those who would watch and listen. Did you get that? Fred Rogers hated what he saw on television, even in those early years. And we say there's nothing good on TV today. But at the same time, he had this crazy idea to turn television into something nurturing, especially for children which he did. 32 years, 895 episodes. Started in black and white, then going to color later on. Many, many children from 1968 to 2000 learned about neighborliness, being gentle, caring, welcoming, helping. They learned that from Mr. Rogers and his cadre of puppets. A crazy idea, clearly inspired by God, and it helped to shape the lives of children. Some years there are almost two million households watching. Abraham, Mother Teresa, Fred Rogers. Unlikely, no, crazy callings from God. But they answered the call. Whether they grumbled or outright protested, we don't know. What we do know is that what they did for God definitely seemed crazy at the time to anyone who was watching. And it may have seemed crazy to them as well. And yet, look what their obedience accomplished. Look at Abraham, father of many nations, countless descendants, ancestor of Jesus Christ, and one of those what-if turning points in the history of salvation. 
Mother Teresa, elevated the status of the desperately poor and sick in the slums of Calcutta, brought healing, physical, mental, and spiritual, to countless people, and inadvertently attracted followers that eventually formed the Order of the Missionaries of Charity, carrying on her good work in risky areas throughout the world. Fred Rogers hated television so much that he jumped in with both feet to wrestle something good out of it, and he changed the lives of millions of children by so doing. Now, friends, I don't know what crazy thing God might be calling you to do. I know that in my own life, I have felt that nudge, that call to do something crazy for God here and there, and I have not regretted it. Now, of course, you need to test the spirits, as Scripture tells us, to make sure, as best as you can, where that nudge is coming from. Worst case scenario, if it turns out that it was not from God, God can still help you to bring something good out of it. But first, we have to be willing to listen, to sense, and then to pray and discern, and finally to act in faith, no matter how crazy it seems. And here is where our reading from Proverbs comes in handy. When you think you have reasoned your way out of doing something crazy for God, when it makes absolutely no sense to you or anyone else, but you still feel that God wants you to do it, then remember this quote, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Indeed, friends, God will make straight your paths, no matter how crazy they might seem at the time. Amen. Now may God's steadfast love be etched into our souls. May we carry it with us always, whether welcoming the stranger, whether risking all we have, whether facing the cross, whether wrestling with God's call, whether freeing ourselves from our past. And now, may God be our constant companion on our lifelong journey of trust. Amen.